record number of teams lined up for this year's Peck Shield Harbour Swim held in Evans Bay, Wellington, and a doctor gives every competitor a thorough check before the race begins. It's a handicap event and the starter sends the men and women competitors off one at a time. The course is a triangular one round Evans Bay and the total distance is a mile and a half. Tough going for even the best of swimmers. The water was cold, but otherwise conditions were good except for a slight chop on the northerly leg of the course. Approaching the top mark, the field still well strung out with the limit men holding their lead. But it's a gruelling test of both swimming ability and stamina, and the cold water soon takes a toll. The patrol boats have a busy time picking up competitors, most of whom suffered from cramp. Of the 57 who started, 20 failed to complete the course. Fastest times were recorded by the two scratch men of the field, Colin Jones of Wersa Bay and Jack Blakely of Lyle Bay, who swam strongly to complete the mile and a half in 41 minutes. But for the first time in the history of the contest, the winner was a woman, Miss N. Hudson of the Patoni B team. And in second place was Miss Seeger of the Hut. It's been a good day for the girls. Most points were scored by Miss Hudson's team for Tony B, and they win the Peck Shield for 1948. Pulling out from the wharf at Otahe Bay is the launch of the Yale University Deep Sea Angling and Research Expedition, which has established headquarters on the site of Zane Gray's old camp. They will collect specimens of New Zealand big game and other fish for scientific study. On the way out to the fishing grounds, members of the party fish for bait, and the kawai come aboard fast. Even gloves don't seem to make the fish any easier to handle. At this rate, the bait box is soon filled and the business of catching the big stuff starts. The line is baited with a kawai and trolling operations begin. Two rods are used and the lines are lightly pegged from the rods to the spread outriggers, whose function is to keep the lines apart and clear of the boat's wake. The outriggers also serve as masts for the radio telephone outfit which the launch carries. men relax as the boat cruises in search of the big fish. It's a strike, and man pits his skill against the strength of a fighting fish. It's a swordfish, a striped marlin, so it'll be a hard sporting tussle. are too great. The fish tires and is drawn gradually closer to the boat. After a really strenuous fight, the big fish is hauled aboard to become the subject of scientific research. With lines reset, they carry on looking for further fish. The fluttering pennant indicates success. There's fish aboard, so the shore party has gear ready to unload. Manana 3, owned by Wendell Anderson of Detroit, was freighted to New Zealand for this expedition. She's a specially built 50-foot motor yacht fitted with twin diesels capable of pushing her along at 22 knots. Mr. J. Morrow of Yale University, the ichthyologist of the party, in a neat job of surgery performs a post-mortem. The fish's rose being removed for research purposes.
Into the makeshift laboratory, which has been erected on the beach, the specimens are taken to be weighed and packed for transport back to the USA. A Marco shark is placed in position for making a plaster cast by Yaleman E.C. Migdalski, the preparator with the expedition. A tub of plaster has been prepared and the fish is on the way to having its image preserved for posterity. The work has to be carried out speedily as the plaster is very quick drying. To give added strength to the cast, fibre is mixed with the plaster. The job's finished and the rough edges are knocked off. It takes a team of strong men to carry the negative cast into the tent where it joins others of its kind, from which positive casts will be made back in the States to become exhibits at the Peabody Museum. And so the members of the Yale University Fishing Expedition, who have come all the way from America's east coast, cruise out into the Bay of Islands once again to obtain further specimens of New Zealand big game fish for scientific research. Otago celebrates its 100th year, and on the main street of Dunedin passes an impressive centennial procession. Thousands of people have come from all over the Dominion, and the Governor General, the Prime Minister, and other distinguished persons are also visiting the city to join in the celebrations. Floats that comprise a large part of the procession are the result of much ingenuity and many weeks' hard work. Some of them are made entirely from flowers, and it's the first time in the country that anything so ambitious has been attempted. The Armed Forces float recalls the nation's contribution to the war effort, and the Red Cross volunteers remind the people of the part they too play in the community. A diversion on the sideline. Looks like some cars are having their 100th birthday too. The Governor General salutes the intrepid drivers and the procession goes on. depicts the first sailing ship to arrive in Port Chalmers and the kilted girl signifies the Scottish influence. But this is just the end of the parade, for in the evening there's a mighty fireworks display. No less than 130,000 people turn out to gaze upon the greatest blaze of pyrotechnics that's ever been seen in New Zealand. There's no charge for admission. is also present at the display in fireworks. One of the most complicated reconstructions is a naval engagement between opposing groups of cruisers. and the first night of Otago's centennial celebrations end in a blaze of glory. The province enters its second century and the future is bright.